Hello, honeys, and welcome to December. Another month, the closing month of the year. What a time in our lives. I know many of us are either stressed or excited or some combination of the two about the upcoming holidays. I first and foremost have to apologize for missing our scheduled Curtis photography drop last month. This here turkey struggled quite a bit with travel and the holiday rush and all sorts of things, but I promise to keep the personal separate from the professional going forward, and we will be dropping episodes on time through the end of the year and for the foreseeable future. However, speaking of episode drops, in case you missed our social media post the other day, do want to let you guys know, a uh, sort of audio reminder, we will be dropping episodes on Thursdays instead of Sundays going forward. This is partially because of the days of the week that the December holidays happen to fall on, and also because I think that will help us all kind of make sure that we're on time in our work week and, and being productive throughout the scheduled work week. You may also have noticed on that their Instagram post that we will be starting a new series for the month of December. I decided to, what with the holiday rush really kicking in this month, even more so than last, to give all of our brains a sort of break and rather than focusing on entirely new information, we're going to take a look at pop culture as it is today and has it as it has been for a long time by looking at the myths of art history. You know, the ideas of the male genius, the starving artist, that artists have to have some sort of mental illness in order to be great. We'll be diving into all those sorts of things and thus working with topics that hopefully everyone is already a little more familiar with. Without further ado, though, let's get started on Edward Curtis and his photography of natives that is problematic in how authentic it claims to be and that it continues to set that standard for authenticity in spite of its many, many manipulations. As always, we're going to cite our sources real quick. Today's include the Edward S. Curtis collection from the Library of Congress, Edward S. Curtis's gallery website, the Edward S. Curtis page posted by the Smithsonian Institution, an article by Ellie Gascion titled Edward Curtis and the North American Indian, an Exploration of Truth and Objectivity by the Photography Ethics Center, posted in February of 2021. Gilbert King's Edward Curtis's Epic Project to Photograph Native Americans, published by the Smithsonian Magazine in March of 2012, and Sarah Rose Sharp's A Critical Understanding of Edward Curtis's Photos of Native American Culture, published by Hyperallergic in June of 2017. I personally first came into contact with Curtis as an artistic figure, as a photographer, back in a serving course in undergrad that focused on arts of Oceania, Africa, and Native America, and or Native Americans, I should say. In any case, we talked at length about his project to document Native American life as it existed in his time. However, that project was sort of self-undermined by Curtis's need to portray the, the quote-unquote cultures being lost as they would have been in what he saw as their heyday some 200 or so years before. And so he forced the natives to portray his own personal idea of what this heyday would have looked like instead of their lives as they truly existed in that moment. So in seeking a way to document life as it was, Curtis ultimately documented life as it wasn't. And that is the great tragedy of his legacy. But of course, if we left it there, this would be a pretty boring episode. 
So we're gonna incorporate a bit of Edward Curtis's biography into this because honestly, that story is crazy enough to be its own episode in order to contextualize why he was so dead set on this project and why it meant so much to him personally. Edward Sheriff Curtis, very cool, Wild West kind of strong farmer name there, was born in July of 1868 near Whitewater, Wisconsin, and by age 17 was a studio apprentice in St. Paul. However, his promising start was destabilized by a sudden family move to Seattle. However, that move did allow him to meet his wife, Clara Phillips, and the couple ultimately has four kids. The move also allows him to start building a reputation for his own studio with society ladies with their own portraits, eventually leading to native portraiture where he really takes off. His very first native portrait was of a princess named Angeline, who was the eldest of the Duwamish princesses. Curtis will eventually die in 1952 of a heart attack, having seen very little profit from his most famous works. The interesting part, though, is where his career and his photography intersects with his personal life. So in Seattle, he picks up photography with a storm, particularly takes quote-unquote good images of natives living along what would become the Seattle waterfront. He wins a grand prize in a photography competition for a homeward photo not long after and continues building his reputation, especially with local natives, and even starts to travel for his photography career. This includes a trip in the 1899 Harriman expedition to Alaska where he participates as the lead photographer. This is actually the result of sort of a happy accident. He happened to stumble onto the anthropologist and native expert uh, Harriman as part of a lost hiking group near Mount Rainier while Curtis was out and about on his own hike one day. The Harriman expedition was named for the railroad magnate, so this was another networking opportunity for Curtis that would serve him later on in his career. Shortly after that, he goes on a trip to Montana with George Bird Grinnell, who's the editor of Forest and Stream. They traveled some on horseback, They witnessed the Pygen and the Blackfoot people's deeply sacred sun dances, and Curtis is super moved by this experience, especially by the ending of the trip. He says that the view of the valley floor stretched over a thousand teepees, and the Edward Curtis Gallery website states, quote, This event transformed his life and inspired him to create his most famous series, The North American Indian, end quote. This is his most enduring by far and known to many Americans to this day. For the next 30 years, Curtis toured the nation photographing and documenting over 80 native groups, mostly west of the Mississippi, though as far south as the Mexican border and all the way up to northern Alaska, so quite a significant geographic range. The project gains tons of attention and support from political bigwigs of the day, such as President Theodore Roosevelt and J.P. Morgan. Like Curtis, these patrons recognized the temporal pressures. Quote, in 1492, the Native American population numbered around 50 million. By 900, only 237,196 remained. Those that survived faced cultural genocide through a succession of assimilation policies intended to, quote, civilize the savage, end all quotes. So this was a super comprehensive project. The Smithsonian collection from his travels and photography, quote, includes a large number of individual or group portraits, as well as traditional and ceremonial dress, dwellings and other structures, agriculture, arts and crafts, rites and ceremonies, dances, games, food preparation, transportation, and scenery, end quote. Curtis will later produce and direct a silent film based on the mythology of the Rauquitl Indians of the Pacific Northwest. 
The film was in production from 1911 until 1914, and it's unclear if any remnants of it exist today. And I do apologize for any names that I butcher. I did look them up, and I'm doing my best. With a few famous exceptions, Curtis's body of work has largely gone untraced since his death, though he also did some portraiture for the white American elite, namely Roosevelt and their family portraits and weddings. The North American Indian is by far his best-known work. It's a collection of volumes containing over 700 large portfolio images, over 1,500 volume size images, and over 7,000 pages of texts. So it's this insanely detailed part of American history, both in terms of its imagery as well as its process of creation. That particular project was sponsored by J.P. Morgan Sr. at first, and the deal was that Curtis would take five years to create 25 volume sets with at least 500 prints. He would be given $75,000 for supplies and interpreters. Curtis, knowing a great opportunity when he sees one, excitedly agrees and begins work almost immediately. But then, Morgan Sr. dies unexpectedly in 1913, and Morgan Jr. drastically reduces the funding for this project. The income drop takes a huge toll on the Curtis family, which he tries to solve with ye old family road trip. This fails spectacularly. One of Curtis's sons almost dies of typhoid in Montana, and his wife swears to never travel together again. She's so upset, in fact, that she divorces him in 1916, and she gets their home as well as the studio. Ed tries to get even by having one of his daughters help him make copies of certain glass plate negatives before destroying the originals, but it's sort of a moot point because all of his means of profitability, his home, it's all gone. By the time the dust settles on the Curtis's divorce, the time of peak interest in natives and their culture is long gone, and World War I now has all of America's focus. Curtis tries to continue his work anyway when possible, but the native groups of the 1920s were decimated, and the public was completely apathetic. Curtis did try to make a comeback by spending some years on that aforementioned film, which got some critical recognition but flopped financially. He did a short stint in camera work in Hollywood to try and recoup his losses and pay back investors from that failure, but Curtis eventually suffered a mental breakdown in about 1930 after sliding into poverty and loneliness for years. Curtis may have gotten some measure of peace by the huge public response to his collection. The Native American Indian was hugely celebrated then and now. King states, quote, The New York Herald hailed it as the most ambitious enterprise in publishing since the production of the King James Bible, end quote. Funny enough, the same powerful white dudes supporting this project and who were most excited to see it released were the ones causing the ostensible need for it. King also notes that Curtis was working against the clock, quote, before white expansion and the federal government destroyed what remained of their native's way of life, end quote. So the public response was, was hugely enthusiastic to have these records, visual records, and yet very few outside of Curtis recognized their own ironic role in the problem. All right, so now we know about the man behind the lens, we've got to get to the core issue of today's episode. Though his photos live on as great portraits, so do the stereotypes they embodied. These are among the first quote-unquote authentic photography examples and thus, they present us with a complex issue. What is authenticity, especially in terms of photography? Now, there's tons of 
of different uh, artistic heritages that I could have used in order to dive into this question, but I thought Curtis was a really great entry point because his relationship to authenticity is almost as complex as the idea of authenticity itself. The two go so hand in hand that it's almost easier to investigate them together than separately. So, as Lori Lawler states in her book, Shadow Catcher, The Life and Work of Edward S. Curtis, quote, Curtis was far ahead of his contemporaries in sensitivity, tolerance, and openness to Native American cultures and ways of thinking. He sought to observe and understand by going directly into the field, end quote. Sharp agrees with this stance that Curtis did have some empathy, some understanding for the humanity of his native subjects. Um, the issue was his own internalized racism that played out in ways that he may not have even been aware of. So Sharp notes, quote, the fact that he continued to pursue Native Americans as subjects outside of the exoticized trappings of their traditional culture and into the Depression era demonstrates a real transition in Curtis's work, end quote. And I believe she means a transition from a, a financial motivation to a more humanistic one. Sharp also points out how little of a visual record would actually exist of these cultures without Curtis. She says, quote, the prevailing view amongst supporters of his legacy is that the photographs' issues are a product of their time and that they're nonetheless of educational value, particularly in our current climate, end quote. So there's an argument that these photos are of educational value because they speak to these notions of racial power dynamics you know what what would have been the rights and abilities and powers of white versus native peoples then as well as now basically curtis's legacy his photography could be seen as a contribution to collective understandings of racialized histories and injustices. They could be a learning tool. In fact, one curator at the Muskegon Museum of Art says that Curtis realized white America had something to learn from natives, particularly in terms of spirituality, in his view. And one of the tribal chiefs, Larry Romanelli, who works with one of those curators, is enthusiastic about the presentation of Curtis's photography because of its heritage significance to the descendants of the groups featured in these works and the perceptions of good intentions surrounding Curtis and what that means for not only his legacy, but that of the native groups that he photographed. The legacy of Curtis and his, his photography is made all the more complex by being an ongoing source of discussion for contemporary Native artists who still find inspiration in the works and still react to his works in their own all this time later. So the crux of this, this issue with Curtis's collections, his legacy, all of it, is really this this potential for contemporary intersectional use versus its unpleasant history. Because really, Curtis was part of a larger movement of quote-unquote ethnographic salvage going on across the world at the time. Sharp notes, quote, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, Western anthropologists decided to preserve the dying cultures of, quote, primitive, end quote, people. Photography, due to its supposedly intrinsic objectivity, was considered an optimum medium for preservation, end quote. 
And the fact that people believed at the time that there was an inherent objectivity to photography kind of tells you all you need to know about the naivete surrounding the idea of authenticity and how that could be manipulated in in order to reinforce social power structures. In fact, this idea of the quote-unquote dying culture was seen as a natural part of social Darwinism, or the racist belief that inferior races would quote, naturally eventually fall to superior ones, end quote. There's a huge irony and and hypocriticism in this point. The quote-unquote superior races, aka the white people, like Curtis, believed because this was a quote-unquote natural process, the superior races themselves had to document the inferior races while they still existed. So this circles back to that irony of the same people causing the problem are the same ones fretting like, oh no, we need to have records before the problem is unsolvable. It's amazing how that seems to happen throughout time. Anyways, the main point here is that though Curtis may have changed his motivations later in his life, though he and his works can definitely be a source of educational and his- historical sociocultural knowledge, the fact is that they were based on racist beliefs that Native groups were of an inferior race that was naturally doomed to die out. So right along with the problematic origins of Curtis's motivations and the historical context of such motivations, we also have to think about authentic as a problematic term in and of itself. This is mainly because who decides what is quote-unquote authentic? AKA, whose standards are we using? Are we allowing those standards to evolve with the times? And if you think about it, the answers are usually A, not the people who are actually culturally associated with that arts, and B, no, we're not. Take a second to think about where your mind goes when I say the phrase authentic art. Usually, you think of art that comes from African nations, Native American groups, Middle Eastern and Asian regions, Mexico, and South to Argentina. So, marginalization really is a factor. Authentic is associated with different because it comes from historical others. This is supported by Curtis's descriptions of his native fascination and and the foundation of that in the quote primitive customs and cultures or excuse me primitive customs and traditions end quote that he was documenting that he was interacting with. This is also clear through his written notes. Quote the ever-present pipe and its accessories on the tobacco cutting board, quote, the buffalo skin shield, the long medicine bundle, an eagle wing fan, and deerskin articles, and omissions of inconveniently modern items such as clocks in his descriptions of native buildings or homes. So clearly, in Curtis's mind, the only things that are authentic are the things that suggest that Native Americans have been completely untouched by white American culture and that they are living in pre-modern times, so on and so forth. Essentially, these descriptions all promote stereotypical images from as far back as, gosh, maybe 1600s about what Native American groups are like and what their common tools of life are. Though it's not always a factor in these sorts of situations, it certainly was in Curtis's case, 
sometimes quote unquote authentic styles can become popular and then are forced to become static because any evolutions of that style are seen as commercialized or otherwise inauthentic. And so creativity is stunted in favor of profitability. There's a large economic drive in order to prevent artistic and thus cultural evolution. And that can be seen also in Curtis's motivations. Having been commissioned by uh, powerful men interested in perpetuating stereotypes. At the heart of the authenticity problem is really the notions of truth versus accuracy. An artwork can be either or both. For example, an accurate depiction of an action in motion might be accurate in terms of the physical forms depicted, but is it truthful in the sense of informing the purpose or cause of that movement? As Sharp puts it, quote, how truthful can a photograph be without informing the viewer of the full context, end quote. From all of my research, especially on West African performance arts, it certainly seems to me that accuracy is more emphasized in issues of authenticity than truth. Consumers and whether they be, you know, like actually purchasers of artwork or simply viewers they are more concerned with whether that artwork aligns to their expectations of what an artwork should be from uh, an artist of a certain heritage rather than what a truthful representation of that artist's creativity might look like. Truth versus accuracy is especially an issue of photographies because I've said it before and I will say it again. You can't always trust your eyes. Manipulation doesn't or didn't always mean Photoshop. Examples of other types of manipulation can include posing, chemical manipulations such as blurring effects, the use of props or fake backgrounds, and so on. Curtis himself was a pictorialist, which was kind of the earliest form of people who were interested in the artsy pick style. So he was trying to mimic the grandeur of past royal portraits in order to legitimize the subjects of his own portraiture. This means that one can see, if you have a trained eye, you can see his struggle to balance a sort of scientific objectivity with a desire for his images to contain a sort of artistic style or a, a level of beauty especially in a lot of early photography of marginalized people, you have to consider what's going on behind the scenes. It's not always clear if the sitter is in front of the lens voluntarily, whether they chose their attire, so on. And this is a problem of quote-unquote authenticity in and of itself. As Gascioni points out, Curtis omitted the crimes occurring in real time against Native peoples because he considered them outside of his focus, not appropriate for the sort of documentation he was interested in. So Curtis was ignoring the developing history in pursuit of a more idealized history that he was hoping to capture. And that, you know speaks to a problem of, of truth itself. The Smithsonian Magazine article points out that, quote, by the time Curtis had arrived in various tribal territories, the U.S. government had forced Indian children into boarding schools, banned them from speaking in their native languages, and made them cut their hair. This was not what Curtis chose to document, and he went to great pains to create images of Native Americans posing in traditional clothing they had long since put away, in scenes that were sometimes later retouched by Curtis and his assistants to eliminate any modern artifacts, such as a, the presence of a clock in this image, quote, in a Pagan Lodge, end quote. And I have 
put that uh, image into our visual episode for your reference. So Curtis's photography is not really a realistic representation of Native groups even at its own time. It may have been accurate to what the group's lives may have been like a couple hundred years ago, but it was not truthful to their experience in their contemporary day. So this recurring question of truth versus accuracy leads us to a question of ethics and the idea of reinforcing one's own ideal or quote-unquote truthful image of Native groups and whether that can interfere with the idea of objective interaction, whether that can lead one to instead uh, take a pressure-based approach to ethnography instead. This is certainly a concern in Curtis's uh, collections as many anonymous sitters or persons are referenced solely by a title, a native group affiliation, so on, not a name outside of all of Curtis's native team members who would go uncredited. And this is also problematically dehumanizing and generalizing. It suggests all amongst these groups are exactly like the person visible and so skew the representation as seen within to be the truth. I'm aware I'm beginning to beat a dead horse here and so I'll wrap it up by just reminding you all that photos are static and especially this sort of formal portraiture is meant to give a timeless quality. So this sort of image may communicate that that is how this person or a person in this role or this group has always appeared and will always appear or want to be remembered as appearing as. But the reality is that many Native and other groups have assimilated into contemporary regional ways, even by Curtis's day. Photos may be static, but people are not. One such example, also included in our visual episode, is Alexander B. Upshaw, a Crow Nation man who was acting as one of Curtis's translators slash informants. He was photographed by Curtis in indigenous attire, but bare-chested, whereas a fellow photographer, Frank Reinhardt, photographed Upshaw seven years earlier in contemporary suit. So the split may be less based on coercion by one photographer or the other and more to do with Upshaw's own conflicting desires to never be seen as primitive with his respect for his own heritage. However, it is notable that Curtis, who was so gung-ho on portraying quote-unquote authentic Native life, chose to photograph Upshaw in indigenous wear, where even one of his contemporaries was choosing to photograph Upshaw in contemporary uh, American dress. Curtis also took many photos of small groups of natives on empty landscapes in order to suggest that Native Americans still roamed free and controlled the land, which ran directly counter to the realities of the era. This may have also translated to financial motivations. It's possible that more images of breathtaking landscapes would have helped railroad companies like those uh, ran by Curtis's sponsors, namely Morgan, in order to increase their travel slash migration, which would have meant more money for those same companies. Curtis considered himself to be recording the dying, authentic Native cultures he believed would soon be lost. I'm paraphrasing his own words there, as well as the gallery website, forcing them to recreate a romanticized past. As the Smithsonian states, his drive was to capture, quote, daily activities, customs, and religions of a people that he himself called a vanishing race. End quote. If there's anything we can learn from Curtis, it's that 
truth and authenticity and accuracy don't always mean the same things. And thus we are today left with dozens and dozens of photographs of Native Americans by Curtis that are left somewhat in question. Though they can be a great historical resource, they also are just mired in this question of authenticity as truth versus accuracy, and also in questions of the specific racist power dynamics going on in the United States at the time. Curtis's legacy is super complex, so is the question of authenticity, and I hope that getting into this story has given you all a sense of why those questions and legacies are so complex, and also hopefully inspired you to look a little bit closer at any visual records you see in the future of any marginalized groups. This has been our heavy hitter for the month of December, our hard start, so to speak, and we will be easing off as the month goes on into those art historical myths. Thank you so much for listening, honeys. It's a pleasure to speak with you again today, and I will talk to you all next Thursday. Take care and stay warm. This podcast was created, produced, written, hosted, edited, and fact-checked by master's graduate Celia Bugno. Our upcoming music will be courtesy of Kelsey Weber. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe on all of your favorite streaming platforms as well as your social medias.